Good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody this morning? Wow. Clap for me. And everything is so good to have everybody here today. If this is your very first time being here, we want to know about it. In the seat back in front of you, there's a card that says, I'm new. If you'll fill that out, take it out to the Connect Desk. We have a free gift for you. And if you did that already, you say, well, I, I was here last week and did that, Joe. That's fine. If you did that last week, you got a free t-shirt voucher. Take that to the Connect Desk and we want to give you a free t-shirt. Who's ready to worship God this morning? Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, Lord. We love you, Lord, and we're so grateful, Father, that you've chosen us to come here this day. Lord, we pray that you would just be with each and every one of us, Father, this morning, that everything that we do here at this assembly this morning would bring you glory, Father, that you would move in this service, you would draw people to cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. You know, this is a time when we give, and and I'm so excited about giving here at the assembly. And there's a reason for that, and it's because we live in a time right now where everyone's going to tell you that you can find your truth, or that there's multiple ways to salvation. There's all these different paths, but I know that at the assembly, at this church. I know that we carry the, the true message of the path to salvation. And I know that when I give, I'm giving to help that message along. And Wednesday night, Charles was, Charles was uh, giving the message. And, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, there's a verse. He used this passage, but he stopped right here, just short of here. And it made me think of this verse. Uh, I'm going to be at verse 17. For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. We're not merely peddling God's word. We're not merely peddling something. We have a message, a gift of life straight from Christ. And we have, when we give, we give, we sow into the kingdom the opportunity for others to come to the cross and be forgiven, to have their slate wiped clean. It doesn't matter what they've dealt with in their life. It doesn't matter where they come from, what they've been through. We have an opportunity to give and to sow into a kingdom that's going to see those people redeemed and changed forever by the blood of Christ. So this morning as we give, every single dollar that goes into these buckets, this morning as we give, let's pray that God will use them to further the kingdom right now. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give, to sow into your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, that you're drawing men and women right now to the foot of the cross. And we pray, Lord, that everything that we do here would be pr to promote you, Father, and to bring you glory and to bring people to the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you got pain, He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. Been hearing the same old voice to the same old lines. We've been trying to fill the same old holes inside. There's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain. He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know that just ain't right. There's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you 
cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to heaven that we just don't understand things that we'll not be able to comprehend until we get there but what we do know is that those of us who have accepted Jesus on this side of eternity when we get there there's going to be a song that we'll sing that the angels cannot sing because they don't know what it's like they've served him faithfully they've, they've, they've done his bidding since the dawn of creation and they've watched us go from separated from God. The way that we've sang about this morning, that he crossed the great divide, that Jesus had to come and die for our sins. We have experienced a salvation that they've never needed. And friends, sometimes I catch myself thinking about what that moment in heaven is going to be like. When the saints of all the ages, from every tribe, nation, language, and tongue, We'll lift up our hands and our hearts, our voices in song. And we're going to sing a song. It probably won't be the old rugged cross. I kind of hope that it is. The other day I was in the car with my son Gabe, who's sitting right down here on the front row. And we like to listen to music in the car. And when dad picks the music, it's usually Southern gospel music. And he said, dad, can we listen to some music? I said, yeah. He said, but can we please not listen to those people? <laughs> what he meant was, can we not listen to songs like the old rugged cross? I can't help it. There's just something about it. Because I've lived it. And so have you. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Without the cross, there's nothing. Without the cross, there's no hope. There's no life. There's no joy. There's no peace. There's no salvation. Without Jesus, we have nothing. So I just wonder, could we sing it one more time? Just, just the chorus. I'm sorry. Can we sing the last verse and the chorus? I'm not going to do it. I'd like you to do it. I'll sing along from up here. Let's worship and let's think about what that moment in heaven is going to be like. Just a little bit longer. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true It's shame and reproach gladly bear Then he'll call
Amen. Amen. Lord, I thank you for the old rugged cross. I thank you for what it means for somebody like me. I thank you, Lord, that you, you saw fit to send your son to die for our sins before we ever acknowledged your name, before we ever acknowledged our need of you. Your plan was to bring us back to you. Lord, my prayer is that as we go into your word, it's a bit of an awkward moment. There's a transition from one mode to another, but Lord, may our hearts stay in that place of worship, thankful for the cross. And as we go into your word, that that our, our hearts would still be fixed in that direction, that every word would point us closer to you. And that if there be even one here today who has not yet accepted Jesus as Savior, they would see fit to do so today because of what you're doing in this house. And Lord, what they see that you've already done in our lives because of the old rugged cross. And I thank you, Jesus. We ask this in your precious name. Everybody said, amen, amen. God is good, isn't he? All the time. Hey, I wanna say it again. Welcome to the assembly. If it's your first time here, my name is Pastor Charles and I'm not the pastor. I get to work with the pastor, Pastor Dwight Hensley down there on the front row. Um, But he asked me a few weeks ago if I'd be ready to speak today. And so here we are. And if you can't tell by the words up on the screen behind me, we're gonna talk today about one of my favorite topics, okay? God speaks. And I wanna start with a question. Where's, Where's all the married men in the house? Raise your hand. Married guys, raise your hand. All right, can we give a round of applause to all the married men who made it to church this morning? I say that with no sarcasm. I think it's an important thing to have families at church when possible. And men, that includes you, so we're glad to have you here. But married men, I wanna ask you a question, see if you can empathize with what I'm getting ready to explain. Um, have you ever had this, this terror wash over you? Okay, let me explain where the terror comes from. You're sitting at, at, at your house, you're sitting on the couch, and your wife is sitting next to you, and she asks you this question. She says, what did I just say? See, you're laughing, but it comes from a place of fear because I guarantee you that all of you, if you're like me, you've done this. You realized you were part of a conversation, but you realized that after the conversation had been going on for just a little while and you have no idea how long. You don't know, are you a character in this story? Is the story about you? Is this something that's happening right now or is it something that happened way, way like 50 years ago and she's only 27? You know, um, is, this, is there gonna be a pop quiz because you are not ready? What did I just say? Okay, I've been there. My wife will tell you. If we're at the house and we're on the couch and the TV is on, okay, I've got three little kids. Um, my oldest is getting ready to turn 10 in two days, so 10 and under. My TV, I don't get to decide what's on my TV. It's all Bluey and, and Coco Melon and it's all these little kid shows that I should have no interest in. But if my wife comes in the room and the kids are watching a show and I'm looking at the TV with them, she knows I'm in it. I don't care about the, the oh, if it's Bluey, I do care, okay? I love Bluey. If you're not watching Bluey, get it together. But um, I, I'm into these little kid shows. I can tell you who the characters are. I can tell you how long it's been on. I can tell you the story. I can explain it to you and I'm not gonna turn it off till it's over because I wanna know how it ends. I don't know why I am that way. But my wife will tell you if she's got something to say or something I need to hear, she's gotta turn the TV off. And she obviously doesn't need my permission, but she will do that because she knows I'm not going to hear her if the TV is on. Now, I love my wife much more than I love TV. I'm not going to tell you how much because there's not really a scale here, okay? But I'm just saying, I want to hear what she has to say. But there's obstacles. There's sometimes there are, are, are things that get in the way of communication. A lot of it is our fault. I had this conversation with somebody literally just the other day here at the church. What is the point of communication. What's the point? The point of communication is to be heard, okay? We use microphones here in the sanctuary because you're all kind of spread out. And if we're gonna say something that is of any importance, and I believe the word of God is of absolute importance, if we're gonna talk about it, it needs to be heard. There's no point in communicating if the people you're talking to can't receive what you have to say. That's why we spend time in preparation and study and I've practiced this message with nobody else in the room a couple of times already because I wanna remove every barrier that lies within me to getting God's word to you because the point of communication is to be heard. Any relationship, whether it's our relationship right now as someone speaking and you being the audience to receive or whether it's your, your spouse or your kids or your coworkers, your friends, anybody you're in relationship to, if you're gonna communicate to them, you have to be ready. You've got to remove all the barriers and obstacles or communication cannot be accomplished. But communication is a two-way street. 
And that's where God comes in, in our little discussion today. We're in a church that, that thankfully, I'm very proud of this fact, that we have focused on prayer in a way that we haven't before at the assembly. Our theme for the year is pray first. And we have prayed a lot. We pray every Wednesday night. We talk about prayer every Wednesday night. Prayer is not just something we do. It's part of who we are. Amen? And it should be. But I worry if sometimes our prayer is simply one-sided. The point of communication, yes, is to be heard. So we make our request known to God as scripture tells us that we should. And we talk to God often and consistently as we should. But if we don't ever take the opportunity to stop talking and allow God to talk back, we don't have a dialogue. We're not really communicating because we're not giving him a chance to speak. And if you've been at the assembly long enough to hear me share anything at any point, I come to this point quite often. Because I will tell you, there are a lot of things that will change your life found in the word of God. But if you want to live in a growing, thriving, ever deepening relationship with God, you've got to learn to hear God's voice. If all you expect to do is be able to come to God and just give him what you, your list of needs and wants, God will, will be faithful to you. God will honor his relationship and his commitment to you. But if you really want to know God, you need to know God's voice. And if we are a church, if we are a body of people who understand not just that God speaks, but how he speaks and when he speaks, it will change everything about who we are and what we do. So today I want to talk about God speaking to us and how we can be prepared for that when he does through the filter of 1 Samuel chapter 3. If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to turn there and follow along with me. There's something about having the physical page in front of you. I understand that it might be a, a, a tablet or a smart device of some type, or if you don't have either of those things, it's going to be right here behind me, okay? Just encourage you to follow along, and you may be familiar with this story, but for those who are not, Samuel was an actual person, okay? First and second Samuel books in the Old Testament. Some of the most action-packed stories in all the Bible are in the book of First Samuel. So to give you a little bit of context who Samuel was, Samuel's mother was named Hannah, and she lived during a time in Israel when God didn't speak very often because there wasn't really anybody listening. And Hannah cried out to God as a married woman who was married to a man with two wives. She was one of two. The other wife in this, this family, she had many children. She had a lot of children, had no problem conceiving. And Hannah could not conceive a child. So she went to the tabernacle, which was where God's presence dwelled, in the town, the city of Shiloh, where the priest lived. And she cried out to God. She, she went before God's presence. She sacrificed, she made offerings, and she cried out to God in such a way. She said this. She said, Lord, if you'll give me a son, if you'll give me a child, I will give him back to you. And so just a short while after that, she conceived. She had a son that she named Samuel, and she honored her commitment to God. God did his part. She was going to do her part. So she literally took her son Samuel back to Shiloh and gave him to Eli the priest. That was her deal with God. Now she would go and visit, and she'd make several trips there, and they had a relationship, but Eli raised this boy. But yet he lived in a time in Israel when God probably wanted to speak. I would say definitely wanted to speak, but nobody was paying attention. And that's all about to change in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Follow along with me if you would. We're going to pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 2. It says, One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli, said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Point number one is this, God speaks to the receptive. I'm going to give you three of these type of statements today, three attributes, three characteristics of those who hear God speak consistently, who hear God speak clearly. Number one is God speaks to the receptive. I have a family member who may end up watching this video later, so I'm not going to say his name, but he probably knows I'm talking about him. Um, I grew up with this person and um, had, had difficulty communicating with him. 
uh, for a lot of reasons, but one of them being is um, he would start a conversation with me, for example. He'd be sitting at the house or driving somewhere and start a conversation and would, would ask me a question and I would go to answer the question. I'm in mid-sentence answering the question and he would say something else, totally unrelated to what we were talking about, which told me he wasn't paying attention. And this happened a lot. Like, it would just be like he was in a whole other world. And now that I'm an adult and not a child, I understand exactly how that happens. As an adult, there's 48 things that you could think about or talk about at any given moment, and all of them cost money, okay? And usually it's money that you don't have, right? And so you're stressed, and obviously you're distracted, and you want to talk to your kids, right? But when you talk to them, it's like, oh, there's all these other things. As much as I want to listen to them and focus on them, there's all these other things rattling around up here, and it's easy to get off track. But as I was growing up, I didn't understand that. I was a kid. I didn't know what anything cost, much less how many things that would cost money. And so I would get frustrated. And I, it, what do you think that made our conversation like? I, I, I didn't want to talk to this person very often because I felt like I wasn't being listened to. I felt like, you know, you, you're just doing it out of obligation or whatever. And I wasn't very receptive. And for a long time, honestly, I'll say up until a few years ago, made our communication very strained and, and, and very difficult because we didn't really know how to talk to each other. And I think about God putting it through that same filter and say, does God feel that way about me? Obviously, God wants to talk to me, but when he looks at me, does he see someone who is receptive, someone who is ready to receive from him, or is it someone who's just distracted? Maybe you can think about a time when you, you, you sat down or you knelt down in your, your prayer closet to pray and you, you wanted to talk to God, but right, there was all this stuff from the day, all these problems, all these things that needed your, your attention or, or what was coming tomorrow or what happened yesterday, and your, your brain is so scrambled that you can't just tune it all out and hear God speak or even just talk to him. We have to be at a place in our life where everything else comes after that. We have to be ready to listen when God speaks. And we look here in, in 1 Samuel and we see someone who is ready to hear God speak. And it turns out it was not the person you would expect. You think Eli the priest, the one who served God, the one who had actually been in God's presence unlike very few people in, in the nation of Israel had. And, and God starts to call out in the night, not to the aged priest who had served God all of his life, but to the young boy who had never heard God speak in the first place. Why? Well, look what Samuel did. When God called him, even though he thought it was Eli, he woke up out of a dead sleep in the middle of the night and he goes running to Eli and says, here I am, you called me. I don't know very many kids in the world today who would do that. If you get them to go to sleep, if you try to wake them up, it's not gonna happen. But God called and Samuel moved. He was out the door, ready to go. Here I am, you called me. Here I am, you called me. Finally, Eli realizes, hey, if I'm not calling him, somebody else is and it better be God. He says, here's what we're gonna do. Go back and lay down, and if this happens again, here's what you say. And then something happened. Something different happened. God had called three times, but the last time, he came. God came and stood there, and he called him twice. And what did Samuel say? Speak, for your servant is listening. God speaks to those who are ready to receive. God speaks to those who are receptive, who are listening for his call, and when he calls, they move. You say, well, how do I know if that's me? Think about these questions. These are questions that I've asked myself over the last few days. Number one, when God speaks to me through Pastor Dwight's sermons on a Sunday morning, how do I respond? Am I the first one out the door, or do I linger at the altar to pray? When God speaks to me through his word during my daily Bible reading time, how do I respond? Do I rush through the day's passage so I can simply check it off of my to-do list? Or do I spend time meditating on what I just read? When God uses a friend to correct my behavior or to challenge me to grow in a particular area, how do I respond? Do I get angry and spiteful? Or do I lean in and take their words to heart? You see, God speaks. Does he use the big booming voice in the sky? Very, very, very rarely. It happened a handful of times in the Bible. It's happened a handful of times in the world since then. But make no mistakes, friend, he might not get on the loudspeaker and shout your name in the middle of the night, but he is speaking to you. How? Through your pastor? Through your daily Bible reading time and conversations with him? Through your friends and mentors and coworkers and family members, the people that, lo that love you and care about you? God speaks to them about you. It's just about are we ready to respond when they do? Are we receptive? If you're waiting for God to just shout out your name and, and call you out and stop you dead in your tracks, I don't think we're ready for that. 
if we're not ready to listen when he speaks to us in other ways right now. But I promise you, friends, if you want to see your life change for the better, you will get good at listening to what God has to say. Well, how am I going to know? This question comes up a lot. How do I know that it's God? And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But let's just be honest and say, we know. We know. Well, I, I, I just had this thought that maybe I should, should, should send, give some money in the Neighbors Nations offering next month. I don't know if that was God. Really? Do you think the devil's going to tell you to give your money to Jesus? No. Well, I, just, I don't know if I'm supposed to serve on that Connect Team or not or go through that Next Steps class. Do you really think the devil's going to tell you to go and get more involved in your church? No. He doesn't want you alive, much less serving in church. Let's be honest, friends, and say we know that God is talking. We just, just have gotten used to not listening. But if we would take Samuel's example to heart, and when God calls in the middle of the night, we get out of bed and listen. When God calls in the early hours of the morning, we get up and we listen. When God calls to us while we're driving down the road on our way to work or home from work, we listen. Why? Because what God has to say matters. It matters. We just have to be ready to listen when he speaks because God speaks to the receptive. Number two, God speaks to the transparent. God speaks to the transparent. Pick it up in verse 11. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was it he said to you, Eli asked? Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. If we're listening to God speak, and all we ever hear God say is good things, I don't think we're listening to God. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If all we ever hear God say is, I love you, I want to bless you, I want you to be rich and famous and everybody like you and get along with you, how many people do you know like that? None. The truth is, God would say some of those things about us. God doesn't want you all to be rich and famous, just me, okay? So... (laughs) He told me this morning on the way here. God speaks to the transparent. He speaks to those who are honest. And he speaks through those who are honest. Think about the messenger and the recipient in this little story. Eli deserved what he got from God. And it all played out in the next few chapters. I don't say that to be mean, but that's what scripture tells us. His sons had blasphemed the altar of God. They had done things that the law specifically said you should never, ever even think about doing. And they did it. And when their father tried to rebuke them, they laughed in his face and he just let them keep doing it. They were priests in the house of God and they deserved to die where they stood. Instead, they died in shame on the battlefield. But that was God's message. Think about the very first message Samuel heard from God was, hey, you know that mentor of yours that's asleep next door? I'm going to kill him and his family. That's what that message was. Samuel being a young boy, having never heard God speak, gets this doom and gloom, thunder and fire from heaven kind of message from God and then wakes up the next morning and wants to keep it to himself. Wouldn't you? Eli calls him and says, hey, come here, let's talk about what happened last night. What did God have to say? He's like, well, you know, he just wanted to say, hey. Wanted to check in. He thought you were asleep. So he told me, no big deal. You'd want to like, fudge the details a little bit, right? You want to be like, you know, let's not talk about this right now. But Eli pulls him in close and says, essentially, don't you lie to me, boy. Well, then you got to tell the truth, right? And he laid it out for him. God said, trouble is coming, just like he said. He didn't hide anything. The Bible says it twice. He kept nothing hid from Eli. 
And to his credit, even though it wasn't what he wanted to hear, he knew it was coming. Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what he sees as best. God speaks to the transparent. Those who can look at their lives and honestly say, I needed that. I deserved that. And he speaks through those who he can trust to get the whole message out. You see, Samuel could have lied. God left that in his hands. There was nothing, nothing that was obligating Samuel to tell the truth. But he did. And I think that's why God spoke to him. Because I can tell you, we live in a world today where people who call themselves pastors and preachers open up God's word that is not open for interpretation and opinion. And they make it say things it was never intended to say because they don't want to say the hard truth. They don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. They don't want anybody not to like them. They don't want anybody to stop going to their church or watching their YouTube channel or whatever. But here at the assembly, friends, we have a pastor who's willing to talk about the hard things. And we need that. Not for the sake of being offensive. That's not what it's about. Not for the sake of hurting people's feelings or making ourselves look better. The truth is the truth, and that's it. That's all that the world needs. And let's be honest about ourselves. That's what we need. We need the truth. Because we can't live it until we have it. And it takes an honest look at our own lives. When our pastor brings the word on a Sunday morning, we look at our own lives and we say, was that for me? Was that about me? And if it is, what are we going to do with it? It's not just about hearing what God says. It's not just about being receptive. It's about being honest and transparent enough to say, I don't like that because that hurts me. That stepped on my toes a little bit. Because deep down inside, I realized I needed that. Because he is the Lord. And he knows I am not. And when God speaks, when we're receptive and we're transparent, that's when change can come. No, things did not go well for Eli and his family after that. And I'll let you read that for another time. But after this, after Samuel rightly handled the, handled the word of God, things began to change for Israel. As he grew, as he matured, as he became more prominent in his position of leadership in Israel, God began to stir up the hearts of the people and they returned to him in a way they had not in hundreds of years. And it started with one little child, one boy, who heard God speak and he responded. He rightly handled the word of God. So friends, when God speaks to us, we can't sugarcoat it. Whether it's for us or for someone else, we can't hold back. Not that we're out to hurt people, not that we're out to, to destroy relationships, but that we're about to being honest because no good change ever came from a lie. God speaks to the receptive and God speaks to the transparent. Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. He said, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need God to speak. Why? Because we need to be equipped to live the life he's called us to live. And that means we need to be rebuked, corrected, trained in righteousness, and equipped. We can't have that if all we're ever gonna get is the sugar-coated, feel good stuff it's got to be the bold faced truth that scrapes against my life and shows me for what I am so that I can go out and tell somebody about the real Jesus the one who can change their life amen one more God speaks to the receptive God speaks to the transparent and finally God speaks to students of his word God speaks to students of his word Finish it up here in 1 Samuel chapter 3, back to verse 19. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. After what happened to Eli, which again led to his, his death at a very old age, and his sons at younger ages... Samuel kind of stepped in at a, at a, as a, probably a, a young teenager. And as he grew, he began to teach God's people. And he was attested as a prophet to the Lord by everyone north to south, Dan to Beersheba, in all the land of Israel. He was a student of God and God's word, even at an early age. And he shared it with God's people. That's what that means. When he was sent to speak for God, the people were like, yeah, that sounds like what God would say. And he could not have done that if he had not leaned in. 
and gotten to know God personally. What we just read, it says that God continued to appear to him. And God, unfortunately, isn't doing that for us. I'm, again, I'm not sure that we could handle it. But he has left us his word through like First and Second Samuel. Things that Samuel would have written down and that others, after he was gone, recorded about his life. We have God in this printed word. We just have to know what it says. And again, if you've ever heard me talk at any length about anything related to God, I come back to this point about 80% of the time. You might think I've just run out of things to say. I promise you I have not run out of things to say and I'm not even close. But this is that important because Jesus is not walking and talking on the earth right now. But we have his Holy Spirit and we have the word of God. And if I want God to speak more often than not, he's gonna speak to me through his word. And if I don't understand what it says, I can't hear God speak, much less say something for God like Samuel did. If Samuel had stood up, even as a, a young adult, he's been doing this for a long time, and he stands up and he starts to talk, and somebody in the crowd says, that doesn't sound right. I don't, I don't think that agrees with what we were talking about last week. I had that happen to me once when I was a children's pastor. This is not in my notes. I just remember Ben Frederick was his name. I got up, and I used curriculum. Somebody else wrote the curriculum. I just taught it. And I'm just going to confess, it was during a busy time of the year, and, and I was running behind, and I had not had as much time to prepare for the lesson the second week as I had the week before. And I got up that morning, and I'm going through the curriculum. It's written out on a printed page. There's slides and everything were done. I just had to go along with their script, and I got flustered. I got distracted by something else, and I wasn't prepared, and I said something that wasn't necessarily like, it wasn't bad. It just wasn't right. And, and Ben Frederick, being all of eight years old, raised his hand and said, you know, last week you said this, and he quoted me verbatim. I wish more people would pay attention to the preacher and could record what he said verbatim. But he used his gifts for evil that day. And he reminded me, but you said last week, and then today you said this. And I said, you know what, you're right. But we're not going to talk about that right now. <laughs> I had to just stumble my way forward because he was right. I had said something that contradicted what I said the week before. And God has never done that. Never once has God contradicted himself. And there's a whole host of people in this world that want to look at God's word and say, well, it doesn't agree. It contradicts itself. And I wanna, we have just a few minutes left. I wanna, I wanna, to, I wanna do, I wanna walk through a little exercise here for a few minutes. And I wanna prove to you that even in the confusing places, God's word stands true. I wanna use an example from 1 Samuel chapter three since we're already here. It says twice in this passage, God came and stood there. God came and stood there at the beginning and then God continued to reveal himself, which continued to appear to Samuel in Shiloh. That's what it says, right? So twice in the same passage, it tells us that Samuel saw God, not just once, but repeatedly. But there are other places in scripture that say, no man can see God and live. So some have used this passage right here, for example, to say, well, what about that? Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. God is having a conversation on the mountain of God with Moses. The Exodus has taken place. The Ten Commandments have been given. And Moses had this unique relationship with God where when he wanted to talk to God, he would go up on the mountain for weeks at a time and they would commune, they would have fellowship, they would talk. The Bible tells us face to face like a person would talk to his friend. And yet in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, in that passage, Moses talks to God and says, show me your glory. And God himself in Exodus 33, 20 said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. And then just a few hundred years later, we read 1 Samuel chapter three, where it says that God came and stood there, that God appeared in a physical, tangible, visible way to a young boy and he didn't die. So which one is right? Which one is true? I had this thought when I was practicing this, I was gonna have you like by a show of hands do a little survey. How many of you think you can see God and live? And how many of you think you can't see God and live? And I was going to have you get up and move and like sit in these two camps with the middle dividing you. And then we're going to fight and debate it out. We don't have enough time for that. And that's probably not a good idea. I've, I've reconsidered it. But just think about the question, okay? Can we see God and live? Can we see God's face and live? Or can we not? Exodus 33, 20, 1 Samuel chapter 3, plus every other verse in between. For example, this is Old Testament stuff, what we're talking about. But what about the New Testament? In 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, one of Jesus' own followers at the end of his life, John, 1 John 4, 12 says, no one has ever seen God. 
But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. John had no problem acknowledging that God was in us or that God could work through us. But he said in 1 John 4, 12, no man can see God. No one has ever seen God. Well, that settles it, doesn't it? No, but what about what Jesus said? In John chapter four, literally the same John about 40 years earlier records the story about Jesus meeting with a woman at the well in Sychar, the Samaritan woman. And he says, God is spirit, John 4, 24. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. So when God says, no man can see my face and live, do you know why that's true? God doesn't have a face. The psalmist would say, God, God's arm is not too short to save. God doesn't have arms. Psalm 91 talks about us finding shelter in the shadow of his wings. God doesn't have wings. God doesn't have a body. God the Father doesn't have a body. So when we, we talk about God having a face or eyes or arms or legs or, or standing upon the earth and all these things that are these, these metaphors that we read in Scripture, they're, they're called anthropomorphisms, which is a $10 word that means this. We ascribe things to God to help us understand God because I have a body and I have arms and I have a face. And I'm trying with my little brain that's in this head to understand a God I cannot see and doesn't look like me the way that I think he should. So we try to describe God in a way that makes sense to our finite brains. And Jesus summed it up in that verse, talking to the Samaritan woman. He says, God is spirit. He lives in unapproachable light. So that answers the question, God doesn't have a face, so we don't have to worry about seeing his face. So what did Samuel see? Because he saw somebody. Colossians chapter one, verse 15. The son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. John 14, nine and 10, Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Who was it that came and stood at the foot of Samuel's bed in the middle of the night? It was King Jesus. Who was it that continued to meet with him and walk and talk with him and mentor him after his mentor was, was dead? It was the pre-incarnate Christ. And you can argue with me all day long about that. I would love to have that discussion. I promise I won't be ugly to you. But I can just tell you, I see it over and over and over in scripture where it says that God appeared, that God showed himself. And now we hear stories from around the world today. Men and women in Muslim countries are being awakened in the night and they see Jesus with their own two eyes and they put their faith in a God that the moment before they thought was dead and gone and had nothing to offer them. Why? Because Jesus is still showing up in lives today because he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, slain before the foundations of the world. He is the great lamb of God that's worthy to open the seal in Revelation chapter five and chapter eight. He is the one that we look to and that if we're ever gonna see God before we get to heaven, it's gonna be him. Now, if you go home today and you say, well, Charles said that I can see Jesus and I'm gonna sit right here and pray until I see Jesus. We probably won't see you at church next Sunday morning because you're still going to be waiting. Maybe, probably. If not, I'll take credit for that. <laughs> we have to put this into the realm of reality and logic as well. Sometimes, sometimes God shows up in that way. Oftentimes he doesn't. But it doesn't mean he's not there. This little exercise is not to point out that we can see Jesus and not die. The point is this, God's word is true. Every word of it, every single word of it, translated over a period of thousands of years, over 40 authors from different language groups and backgrounds and historical eras, got it right every single time. Why? Paul said it, all scripture is God breathed. And it all points to Jesus. Why? Because of what John 1 says. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus. If you want to know Jesus, friend, just read your Bible. He's right there. Every word points to him every time. 
Can you see him with your own two eyes before you get to heaven? Maybe, but if not, you can still see him and know him in the pages of scripture. It is your gift from God so that you can know him, so you can see him. The question then becomes, are we willing to receive what God's word has for us? Are we honest and transparent enough to receive what God has for us when it's hard and when it's difficult and when it's painful? That only comes through being a student of God's word. And if we are willing to dedicate ourselves, our lives to knowing God more through his word, I promise you, I promise you, you will hear him speak to you. It might not always be comfortable, it might not always be easy, but it'll be from him. And this is always the most difficult part of any message. How do you finish it? You get to this point, you say what you think you need to say, and then you're like, well, what am I supposed to do with this now? And that's where we all are. I think it comes to this place where I I can't answer for you. I know many of you, I look at your faces, and I I know your name, and I know your your, your spouse, I know your kids a little bit, but, but I don't know you the way that I know myself. I can be more honest with myself than I can be with anybody else. I'm not saying I'm walking around lying to people and hiding things, but I'm just saying, even when I try to explain to my wife what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, there's a disconnect. Why? Because she thinks and feels differently than I do. So here is the challenge that we're gonna walk through in these next few minutes. As we move into the altar time and worship team, whenever you're ready, you can come on back. I want us to honestly evaluate ourselves. We are intentionally wrapping this up sooner. I'm one of those preachers that I go to about 12.05 most of the time. Am I apologizing for that? No. Will I do it again? Probably. But not today. Because I know how easy it is to say, oh, well, gosh, look at the time. Got to go. I'm removing barriers, removing obstacles. Because the point of communication is what? To be heard. You heard it when I said that, didn't you? Good job, Dylan Steen. Five gold stars for you. I left them at home. I'll bring them next time. The goal of communication is to be heard. And I hope that you've heard this. There are three filters that we have to let everything pass through this morning. Am I receptive? Am I transparent? Am I a student of God's word? I'll make it even more simple than that. Go back to the boy Samuel. When God called, even before he knew God was calling, what did he say? What did he say? Here I am. Five times before God actually got his attention, he said, here I am, you called me. Here I am, you called me. Here I am, you called me. That's where it starts. Even if you think God's talking, what happens on the inside of you? Do you look at the time? It's 11.40 in case you're wondering. Do you think about, oh, if I had time, I would, but I gotta go. Or do you say, here I am. You wanna know why Samuel was qualified to hear God speak? Because his first thought was not, let's wait till morning, here I am. It's not about convenience. It's not about what's on your schedule. There is nothing and no one more important than God right now and at any point in your life. I'm not trying to to diminish what you're doing after this. And I hope that your plans are to come back here at six o'clock tonight for our small groups and kids choir practice and all those things. But even if you're not, right now, there is nothing, nothing more important than him. We have created a space, we have created a a time frame where even if you're scheduled to leave here at noon, if I would just stop talking, you could get to these altars. Some of you are probably thinking that right now. But as we take time to worship and pray together for just a few minutes, think about those three areas. Am I receptive? Am I transparent? Am I honest? And am I a student of God's word? If we can dive into those three things and make them a point of emphasis in our walk with God and our communication with Him, we'll hear Him speak. And as we do, our relationship with Him will grow. It will impact every part of us, every part of our marriages, every part of our relationship with our children, our coworkers, every lost person that we know is going to see Jesus more clearly through our lives. Why? Because we are learning to hear Him speak. And if you're here this morning and you you hear God calling you right now for the first time, kind of like Samuel in the middle of the night, he might not be standing at the foot of your bed, but I believe he sent you here today to hear his word for you. 
And if you are willing to receive, and if you take an honest, transparent look at your own life, you might not know what God's word says, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. The Bible tells you that you're a sinner. And if you were to die today without a relationship with Jesus, you'd go to hell. And I'm not saying that to be mean. I don't know who you are necessarily, but I can tell you about me without Jesus, without the old rugged cross, like we sang about earlier, I'd be one of those people going to hell. And somebody loved me enough as a little boy to tell me the truth about eternity. So I, I want to offer the same invitation to you. If you need Jesus, if you want to accept him as your Lord and Savior, acknowledge that you've done things that are wrong. Put your faith in him because he was willing to die for your sins before you ever even knew his name. If you'd like to commit your life to following him and serving him, just like every other person sitting around you today, you can do that. It's really simple. You just have to make the decision. If you'd like to do that, I would encourage you right now, no more hesitation or stalling. Would you stand up and come to this altar? Say, hey, I need Jesus. I want to accept Jesus. I hear him calling to me today. And I want to respond. I want to be receptive. If that's you, you can come on right now. And I'm going to keep talking to everybody else. We are going to worship. We're going to pray. And there's going to, you know, you're done hearing from me. Somebody else is going to come and close this service here in just a little bit. But we're not going to be in a hurry because we've got a little bit more time today than we usually do. Maybe you struggle in one of those three areas more than the other. Maybe you're a little distracted and you're not as receptive to God's voice as you once were or as you'd like to be. Maybe you've just gotten so content and used to the way things are, you've stopped taking an objective look at your life. And you need to kind of rip that bandaid off and be objective and honest today. Be transparent. Maybe you've slacked in your, your Bible study time and it's just become an item on your to-do list that you move on to the rest of your day. I would challenge you to recommit your heart to studying God's word, his gift to you. Would you stand with me? Lord, this morning, we simply say, in response to your word, you're calling out to us today. Here I am. Whatever you have to say to us in these next few moments, God, help us to be receptive. When your word collides with our lives and our hearts and minds here in these next few moments, help us to be receptive and transparent, honest, hiding nothing from you because you see it already. Lord, whatever you say to us, help us to pass it daily through your word that we might live it out more faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. wasn't rich I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated the breach was far too wide from the dark side of the present you held me in your side Made a way across the great divide Left behind heaven's floor To build it here inside And yeah, at the cross You paid the debt I owe Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I had hope the
you know, that's the message. Charles and I talk about this kind of stuff a lot, but that's the message that's going to be right in my alley because it's focused on us being into God's word so that we can hear God's voice. And Charles and I bounce scripture off each other all the time. It's a, it's a constant thing with us. And there's a passage that I thought of as he was preaching, 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Some, some uh, translations say, do your, do your best to show yourself as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, but avoid a reverent babble for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness and their talk will spread like gangrene. We live in a time where everybody wants to be an expert on scripture but never wants to read their Bible. Where you have tons and tons of preachers who will walk to a pulpit and they'll give a message and never crack open a Bible. And as Charles said, that they will take scripture and twist it into something that it doesn't mean to fit an agenda. We are so lucky, so blessed here at the assembly that we have a pastor and an associate pastor who will give us the truth, even when it's difficult, even when, it, even when it's not what we want to hear, and who will encourage us to dig into the word on our own, to know the word for me, because nobody's going to know it for me. As much as pastor loves me, he can't know Jesus for me. As, as close as Charles and I are, Charles cannot know Christ for me, but he wants me to know him for myself. And I'm so, so thankful that we're at a church that promotes us knowing the word on our own and making a decision on our own to come and serve the one true God. Father, we're so grateful that we've been here this morning. We're so thankful for the opportunity to serve you, Lord. We're so thankful, Father, for people who have made decisions for battles that were won in the heavenlies today, Father. We praise you right now. Lord, for things that we didn't even know were happening behind the scenes, Lord, we're thankful right now, for God, for, for battles that you're winning, for, for fights that you're fighting, Lord, for people right now, Lord. I pray that you would just move in this place, Father. That you would go with each and every one of us from here, Lord, that you would speak to all of us, Father, that you bring us back again, Father, to praise you and to worship you. Lord, we thank you for everything you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Stronger than the wonder working power.